Hello, my name is Michael Mann, and I'm a thoracic surgeon at the University of California out here in San Francisco. Today, I'd like to talk to you about the use of a molecular prognostic tool to assist in the management of early stage non-small cell lung cancer in the here and now. The question that I'm going to address is whether or not we're ready to be introducing molecular prognostic data into the routine management of early stage patients as a support for the decision making that is currently based entirely on TNM traditional staging. I would very much like to thank the organizers of uh, BioConference for affording us this opportunity to talk today about what we hope is going to increasingly become the first step towards true molecular personalization of a disease that has been in desperate need of improved management uh, for a very long time. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I would like to mention uh, that I uh, am and have worked as a consultant for Life Technologies and more recently uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, who own and who run uh, the molecular tool that's going to be a large focus of today's talk. I'd like to set the stage uh, for what we're going to try to accomplish uh, over the next uh, 45 or so minutes. Uh, it should not be hard for me to convince uh, all of the listeners of this talk that there's a desperate need for better, more refined prognostic information in the management of early stage lung cancer. What might be a little bit more controversial is that I'd like to convince you as well that there's an, imme an immediate clinical utility for the use of this improved prognostic information that can allow better differentiation of high and low risk patients within stages one and two of this disease at the present time based entirely on the data uh, that we have at our hands right now and the clinical situation of our patients. Finally, uh, I hope, again, it's uh, a little easier to convince you that there actually is a tool that is extremely well validated and therefore ready uh, for implementation in this type of refined uh, molecular prognostic approach to lung cancer. Now, if we think about traditional staging, uh, which is really the fundamental basis of all of the decision making uh, for non-small cell lung cancer, uh, we're, we were very excited and, and enthusiastic uh, about the introduction of the seventh edition of the lung cancer, uh, non-small cell lung cancer staging system in 2009. It was based on a large amount of uh, clinical data and a large amount of uh, really great work uh, poured in from around the world. But the Achilles heel of that staging system is that it remains based entirely on anatomic and histologic criteria clinical criteria that have been available to us as clinicians for decades, if not centuries. And unfortunately, there seems to be a ceiling to the degree to which we can take the accuracy uh, of and, and really the refinement of prognosis that we're able to achieve based entirely on those traditional criteria. The most striking example is probably the failure of this new staging system to afford us an early stage categorization that really did much better than our older staging systems at identifying those patients who are most likely to be cured with surgery alone and, and those patients uh, who are going to recur with metastatic disease and who are therefore much more likely to benefit from further adjuvant systemic therapy. Now, the widespread uh, screening for uh, non-small cell lung cancer is still a, a bit of a controversial topic. We're hoping uh, as uh, clinicians in this field that we're moving toward earlier and earlier diagnosis of this disease. Suffice it to say that even with greater use of, of chest CT scanning, we're going to continue to find uh, more and more early stage lung cancers. So being able to make better clinical decisions for those earliest stage patients is really going to become only more important in the future. Uh, as they begin to dominate more the clinical picture of lung cancer, which in the past was much more heavily weighted towards uh, diagnosis at later stages. So why do early stage patients die? If they've had a good operation, uh, why is it that we're not curing 
100% uh, of these patients, or at least 90% of these patients, which is much more of the standard, the bar that's reached by other uh, very common solid tumors such as breast cancer and colon cancer. So of course, lung cancer patients do tend to be an older population. They are still a higher concentration of smokers among that population. So of course, they have many other diseases that can contribute to their mortality. But by and large, the vast majority of patients after an operation for early stage lung cancer who die within five years die from a recurrence of their non-small cell lung cancer. And that means that there was metastatic disease that if they had a good operation must have been present at the time of resection of their primary tumor. But since they were early stage by the traditional staging system, we just didn't know that that metastatic disease was there. Now we've always already mentioned that the lung cancer community has been frustrated by a failure to really dramatically improve the outcomes even in early stage disease. And, and that's going back now 30 to 40 years. In fact, most of the more recent progress has been not in early stage disease, but in later stages where finally we're getting a taste of uh, personalization of care with regard to targeted agents. But those agents so far are really only documented to help in late stage disease. So what about our early stage patients that are still, despite surgery, facing 30 to 60% mortality? Well, if we just said that most of these patients are dying with metastatic disease and that metastatic disease almost certainly was present at the time that they underwent their initial operation, can we really think of this perhaps as an understaging of their disease? In other words, are these really early stage patients if they're harboring metastatic disease at the time of their resection? And if they are understaged, if they're really later stage patients, perhaps already in stage four disease with micrometastasis, are we under treating them by leaving them with surgery alone and hoping for the best on subsequent uh, radiologic uh, surveillance and, and other close follow-up? There's another reason why better prognostic refinement of high-risk patients in early stage uh, non-small cell lung cancer is such an imperative. And that's because there is clear evidence that we might be able to intervene and to do something meaningful to reduce the risk of these patients eventually succumbing to their disease. Now, this is a little bit of a switch for uh, non-small cell lung cancer in which we think of chemotherapy as an agent that can slightly prolong survival but not really achieve cure. And that's true for mo most late stage patients. But the data from now multiple large scale prospective studies is that we not only add a few months of survival to patients who undergo adjuvant chemotherapy for early stage disease, but we're actually curing a decent swath of those patients and giving them long-term survival that they otherwise would not have enjoyed without the chemotherapy. We know that from studies uh, that were conducted on, on a large scale with uh, platinum doublet uh, chemotherapies. And we know that the greatest benefit has tended to be seen in those patients with the greatest risk of recurrence. And that's really uh, very intuitive and uh, somewhat logical that those patients who are most likely to recur have tended in each of the studies that has had a positive result, those higher risk patients, i.e. patients at higher stages of disease, have tended to benefit more from adjuvant chemotherapy than the lower stage patients. So we do have something to do for patients who are at high risk for recurrence, and that intervention can actually save lives. So how do we convert that into action at this, at this date and time in the history of the management of non-small cell lung cancer? Well, for stage two disease, you might be thinking there is already a recommendation for adjuvant chemotherapy on the books. And that's true for most stage two patients, a subpopulation of patients in stage 2A and all patients in stage 2B. But as you look across the country and across the world, everyone who treats this disease knows that there's really suboptimal compliance with those recommendations. Not every stage 2 patient undergoes the adjuvant chemotherapy that's recommended. And if we think about why that's true, a large part of that probably comes from the statistics themselves. The studies that have been done until now that have demonstrated a benefit for stage two patients 
have looked at all comers, high risk and low risk. And when you look at all comers, the absolute degree of benefit for adjuvant chemotherapy is relatively small. Absolute benefits in the range of 5 to 10, maybe 12 percent. And when faced with the prospect of a very difficult platinum-based chemotherapy, right when a patient's recovering from a difficult thoracotomy, a lot of patients turn to their doctors and say, I don't think so. The, the, the likelihood of my benefit is too small, and the surety of uh, having to suffer through the chemotherapy is too real. Now, if those patients had a way to understand that they were at unusually high risk for recurrence, that calculus may be very, very different. And we might see a much higher compliance among patients who knew that their more accurate assessment of risk put them in a much higher risk group for recurrence. The situation in stage one is even more desperate because for most stage one patients, there is no recommendation for adjuvant chemotherapy. And yet at least 30% of those patients are gonna recur. Stage two, it's closer to 45 or even 50% of those patients. And so even uh, organizations such as the NCCN have looked at this scenario and they've said it's really unacceptable for us to rely on TNM staging alone because too many of these stage one patients are dying from recurrence when we know that adjuvant chemotherapy at least has a chance to eliminate micrometastatic disease. However, previous clinical studies have just not given us a firm enough ground to be able to recommend that all stage one patients undergo adjuvant chemotherapy or that even all stage one B patients undergo chemotherapy. And so the NCCN looking at this very difficult clinical situation has made the recommendation that we look at the highest risk stage one patients, which by definition is stage one B, and that we look among those patients for signs that there are even higher risk in an individual case. And if we see signs of even higher risk, then NCCN says, go ahead, treat those patients with chemotherapy, even in the absence of prospective clinical studies, because those patients are at such a high risk of recurrence and there is at least a chance that adjuvant chemotherapy could modify that risk. Now, that recommendation, of course, is a level 2B recommendation. It's a consensus recommendation, but it's not supported by prospective clinical uh, studies. It's important to remember though that the default level of support for NCCN lung cancer uh, guidelines is 2A, which is again, lower level evidence with no randomized data. Since there are data that suggest a benefit to patients who are most likely to harbor metastasis, clinicians really have only one choice and that's to synthesize the best possible available information for every patient to assess their risk translate that risk into a potential likelihood of benefit and then make a very difficult decision in each individual case. Should we stay where we are after surgery or should we move forward and try to reduce a very high risk of recurrence? It's always been the case in medicine that more accurate information leads to better decisions and more informed decisions lead to better outcomes. So if it's true that better prognostic differentiation of risk in non-small cell lung cancer would at least better support current NCCN recommendations and potentially lead to better outcomes, is there a molecular tool beyond traditional TNM uh, histologic and anatomic staging that clinicians can turn to for this type of more precise risk stratification in this disease? Well, this is hardly a new topic and it's been over a decade since the first researchers tried to attack this important problem. As many as 15 studies have been published with some degree of success in differentiating risk based on a molecular profile of the tumor tissue itself. So researchers have looked at an expression profile, what genes are on, what genes are being turned off in the lung cancer tissue itself. And they've for sure have been able, as has been done in other cancers, to differentiate a patient's prognosis. But as you can see from this graph, the vast majority of these studies have been run with frozen tissue, pristine tissue brought back to the laboratory from the operating room. And a lot of these studies have therefore been able to depend on microRNA analysis that really leverages the very high quality RNA that can be derived from these frozen samples. But let's ask ourselves an important practical question. 
are surgeons around the country, much less around the world, really going to be snap freezing their patient's tissue and liquid nitrogen in the operating room to facilitate this kind of analysis? The answer, of course, is no, not at least in the near future. So frozen tissue may present a barrier to widespread implementation of a molecular approach to this problem. Now, authors such as Simon and Subramanian looked at this uh, conundrum uh, several years ago, and they stipulated that there were certain requirements that needed to be met if clinicians on a wide scale, wide scale basis were going to use a new molecular tool to guide decision making for their early stage patients. They postulated that a tool would have to be practical, and that's where frozen tissue uh, may stumble. It has to be reproducible, and that may be an area where microarray analysis uh, is not the best tool. But they said particularly it had to have large scale independent validation. And the studies that have been published to date just have, uh, at least up until uh, uh, 2010 or 11, had not really come through with that uh, promise of large scale blinded independent validation. In fact, the one time when uh, blinded validation was attempted, there was really a failure of the assay under study to differentiate risk in stage one of disease, which is perhaps where the greatest need lies. So my colleagues and I at the University of California uh, took on this challenge uh, about five or six years ago, and we decided that we needed to begin our study with the goal of having a practical tool that was based on paraffin tissue that would be available for every patient who underwent resection for non-small cell lung cancer. So we started with paraffin tissues. We had been among the authors who had previously looked uh, at expression profiles from frozen tissue. So we had an idea about which genes were a good target set for developing a practical profile. And eventually we were able to boil down our analysis to 14 uh, genes, 11 of which were cancer related, three of which were uh, present for uh, housekeeping purposes. And we forced ourselves to develop a quantitative PCR approach that would work well and completely reproducibly with RNA of low quality that could be derived from paraffin embedded uh, formalin fixed tissue specimens. We went through a very rigorous statistical process trying to make our new assay as, as reflective, uh, as least uh, reflective as possible of the idiosyncrasies of our training cohort of over 350 patients from UCSF. But what we said was most important about this whole process was that whatever assay we finally came up with, it had to be independently validated in a blinded fashion on a large scale with a completely independent cohort of patients. And we turned to two sources uh, for that validation. Uh, in our backyard here in uh, Northern California, we enlisted the uh, collaboration of the Kaiser uh, Research Division, which is a phenomenal uh, group of uh, clinical researchers uh, who are known for their tenacity in independent uh, validations and who were able to bring to bear a large cohort of patients from their network of community hospitals. So we felt it was a very good uh, re re reflective uh, population. But we felt that that was not enough. And so we turned in the other direction, so to speak, across the Pacific Ocean to our colleagues in China with whom we'd been working uh, where lung cancer is uh, rapidly becoming an, an, an amazing epidemic. And we asked them to do another independent validation with an even larger sample of patients uh, this time in stages one through three to complement the stage one only analysis that was being done in Northern California. Now, just to go over the assay again, uh, step by step, we start with paraffin uh, embedded blocks that can be uh, re retrieved from any pathology department in the world. The uh, RNA extraction was developed specifically for paraffin embedded lung tissue. And then there's a quantitative real-time PCR the results of which are put through a simple formula to, to uh, yield a risk score and uh, patients are categorized then as high, intermediate, or low risk. This assay is now known as the Prevenio assay. Again, it's commercially available for all clinicians and that's through uh, Life Technologies, uh, which is now part of the Thermo Fisher family. Well, this large-scale validation turned out to be the largest uh, really ever attempted on uh, a molecular analysis for non-small cell lung cancer patients in early stages. 
and the results of both of these uh, large-scale studies uh, were published together uh, in The Lancet back in 2011. And uh, you can see a very uh, large number of authors. We actually had to twist The Lancet's arm to allow us to include uh, that many authors uh, on the publication, but it really reflected a huge international effort to try to solve this problem of needing better refined prognostic information for early stage lung cancer that clinicians could rely on today and not wait years and years uh, for this type of benefit to their patients. Now, just to uh, give you a little bit of information about the uh, Clinical Trials Consortium that helped us in China, uh, their leaders in uh, cancer care uh, from uh, around uh, uh, the country in China, though for this study, uh, we really uh, relied uh, entirely on colleagues in Beijing, uh, Shanghai and Guangzhou, three of the major metropolitan centers uh, on the eastern seaboard of China, where cancer care has for many, many years been up to international standards, and where more recently uh, we finally uh, are able to bring their clinical research capability up to uh, uh, global international standards as well. So here are some of the data from those large-scale validation studies. And you can see from both of these curves that the assay succeeded extremely well in separating out high, intermediate, and low-risk patients. This is based entirely on their molecular risk score, derived entirely from gene expression data from qPCR based on the RNA derived from paraffin samples. On the right of your screen, you can see uh, the results from Northern California, stage one patients only. And I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the high-risk patients have a 50% mortality at five years. So that's quite striking for stage one all comers. In China, you can see that in stages one through 3A, we had a very similar separation, uh, even lower uh, overall uh, survival in our high-risk patients, as one would expect uh, from all comers in stage one through 3A. Now, again, authors like Simon and Subramanian insisted that any sort of molecular pro uh, profiling prognostic system really be independent of stage in its ability to differentiate risk if, if it was going to be a useful tool for clinicians over and above TNM staging. And so we asked the question within each stage in our China population, are we able to see a separation of intermediate high and low risk patients? And as you can see from these curves on the left in stage one alone and on the right in stage two alone from our China cohort, uh, that we very easily succeeded with uh, very clear statistical significance in separating out high, intermediate, and low risk patients, uh, even stage by stage. Now, of course, uh, it was important that we undertook uh, both univariate and uh, perhaps even more important multivariate uh, analysis uh, using Cox proportional hazards modeling. And we asked the question, uh, you know, is the molecular profile really a powerful indicator of risk of, of death uh, at five years in, in this case? Sure enough, not only uh, did univariate and multivariate analysis in the presence of all of these other risk factors bear out the relevance of a high risk score, you can see that uh, when other factors were considered the high risk score far and away became the most powerful predictor uh, of a negative outcome. I'd also like to point out that even when we controlled the analysis uh, for tumor size, which is the only one of the high risk criteria suggested by NCCN that has any basis in prospective uh, randomized clinical data, that size of tumor greater than four centimeters really fell by the wayside and paled uh, dramatically in comparison to the molecular risk score in, in its ability to truly differentiate high-risk patients that are most likely to die within five years of their resection and therefore most likely to be those patients who are going to benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Of course, a similar analysis uh, was undertaken uh, using the data from the China uh, cohort of patients. And once again, the high-risk categorization turned out to be by far and away the most powerful predictor of prognosis and therefore uh, the most powerful source of information for clinicians in deciding who among their patients are at highest risk uh, after uh, resection and who are most likely uh, to be in that category of patients who require intervention 
and that we believe would benefit from intervention. Since this was a cohort of patients in which we had stages one, two, and three represented, we could even control for stage itself in asking the question, does the uh, molecular uh, profile add significantly to the prognostic analysis for each patient? And you can see uh, even uh, when we factor in stage, there's a very dramatic uh, uh, hazard ratio for high risk alone. And uh, that really speaks to the uh, independent information that's available uh, from this assay. Now, one other thing I'd like to point out that when we think about this new staging system that, that we are uh, and should be very proud of uh, as of 2009, although many tens of thousands of patients were considered in the end, only 16,000 patients made the cut that had enough clinical data available for the development of that staging system. And among stage one patients, after the analysis was done, there were only 2,000 patients left to validate the stage one prognostic uh, criteria. Well, that 2,000 patient validation really isn't that dissimilar from the 1,500 patient uh, validation that we ran 1,000 of which, uh, roughly, were uh, stage one patients. So we're really talking about a validation now of this molecular prognostic that's really on somewhat of a similar scale to the uh, new TNM staging system itself. That speaks to clinicians' ability to rely on these data uh, for really accurate prognostic information for their patients. Now, we're often asked uh, how to statistically compare this molecular prognostic tool to traditional TNM staging. And that's where clinicians need to be a little savvy in recognizing that there's a difference between a diagnostic tool and a prognostic tool in terms of statistical comparison. For example, we can't really talk about specificity and sensitivity with a prognostic tool because those concepts don't apply in a stochastic assay that's really just assigning a risk but is not assigning a definitive diagnosis. And so at the uh, suggestion of authors such as Simon and Subramanian, we realized that we had to turn to other types of statistical tools to really more aggressively test the ability of this molecular assay to improve upon uh, prognosis compared to traditional criteria, including TNM staging, staging and even including the NCCN uh, supplementation of TNM staging. And this uh, graph represents an ORAC analysis or area under the receiver operating curve analysis, which really is a tool much more designed to compare prognostic tests. And without getting into too much detail about the mechanics of this type of uh, statistical approach, suffice it to say that when we use this tool to compare the molecular assay to NCCN criteria alone, there was a dramatic improvement in the accuracy of prognosis uh, represented here graphically in the uh, dark blue shaded area in which we were really able to achieve a much better discrimination using the molecular profile to assign prognosis, to assign a risk category to the patient compared to traditional criteria, including the high risk criteria that NCCN has recommended uh, for determining candidacy for chemotherapy. Now, uh, in early stage disease, there's a subcategory of patients who we believe have the absolute best prognosis. And those are patients with uh, so-called T1A tumors, tumors less than two centimeters in greatest diameter, who of course are also node negative and therefore stage one. We congratulate those patients when we see them postoperatively in our surgical clinics because we believe that those patients have the best prognosis and we would never have considered further adjuvant in intervention for those patients based on uh, traditional prognostic uh, systems alone. So we asked a very difficult question of our uh, new molecular assay. Can you take even those earliest of stage, staged patients and still identify patients who are at very high risk for recurrence and who might actually benefit tremendously from additional adjuvant chemotherapy to lower their risk of death? And sure enough, we found that this molecular assay, even among stage uh, 1A, T1A patients with only two centimeter or smaller tumors, we were able to identify a cohort of high-risk patients that again approached a 50% mortality at five years. Now that's just unacceptable 
uh, mortality to allow patients to go on uh, when we know that chemotherapy tends to reduce the chance of death, death for high risk, highest risk patients. And it wasn't just a small sliver of those very, very early stage patients that fell into that high risk category. As you can see from the numbers at the bottom of this graph, it was fully a third of those patients that for whom we were able to identify a very, very high risk of recurrence. So this is really uh, a very important uh, progress that can be applied to the management of this increasingly large uh, percentage of early stage non-small cell lung cancer patients who are increasingly going to come to our attention as screening and uh, the more widespread use of CT scanning in general brings more early uh, stage patients uh, to diagnosis and for whom this uh, challenge of identifying those patients who despite having an early uh, traditional clinical pathologic stage are very likely already to harbor uh, undetectable micrometastasis. Now, uh, again, uh, in fullness to full disclosure, uh, since those uh, data were published, a second molecular prognostic assay has uh, been described in the literature. And you can see uh, last year uh, in clinical cancer research, there's, there was a report of the validation uh, of a similar type of uh, RNA-based uh, molecular profiling assay. However, that assay was really based uh, on a test that was developed uh, using prostate cancer uh, and not specifically for lung cancer patients. And that uh, validation uh, tended to suffer from a number of uh, clinical scientific uh, challenges uh, and problems uh, related to implementation of the use of that assay. Specifically, uh, they uh, never succeeded in predefining a cutoff for a score between high and low risk, uh, therefore leaving uh, clinicians uh, really uh, with a, a mystery as to how to interpret uh, the results of the assay for their patients. And a clinical offering uh, that has been based uh, on this assay uh, really depended very heavily on classical TNM staging to provide uh, a risk categorization. So it, it hasn't been very clear from the data that have been available whether there is uh, really a boost uh, to prognostic uh, accuracy provided by this second uh, molecular assay. It does, however, speak to both the need and the feasibility of developing a uh, gene expression-based approach to differentiation of risk in uh, early stage lung cancer. And it may also speak to the need for uh, cancer uh, type specific development uh, of the assay. As far as I'm aware, uh, this assay is not yet available uh, for widespread use uh, as is, again, the Prevenio assay, which is uh, now available from uh, Life Technologies uh, CLIA laboratory. Now, uh, we had a chance at last year's bioconference uh, to talk about this assay. Uh, since then, there have been a couple of new studies, uh, either published or uh, in press, that have addressed more specifically the question of clinical utility for this uh, new approach to integrating molecular uh, prognostic information into the management of, uh, of early stage lung cancer. One study uh, by Dormady and colleagues uh, specifically asked the question, um, is it, are clinicians who are obtaining this assay for their early stage patients actually using that information to modify their uh, clinical decisions regarding those patients? And uh, the results of that study uh, portrayed in this uh, chart indicate that a full 30% uh, or slightly above 30% of all of the patients entered into this study actually had management decisions that were changed as a result of obtaining the assay. About 120 uh, unique patients uh, were considered in this study. Uh, roughly 50 clinicians uh, participated bringing those 120 patients uh, into the study. But was, what was perhaps most striking about uh, the results of this study is that um, if a patient uh, did not have a pre-study uh, decision to go for adjuvant uh, in intervention, adjuvant chemotherapy, but obtained a high risk score, 
So in other words, these were patients who got a high risk score and had not previously been considered candidates for chemotherapy. 75% of those patients ended up undergoing adjuvant chemotherapy as in an attempt to reduce that high risk of uh, post-operative recurrence and death from lung cancer. So that suggests that clinicians really are willing to rely on this type of molecular analysis of their individual patients' tumors to influence their clinical decision-making. And again, this is in the absence of specific prognostic clinical data that guarantees that there is a documentable benefit uh, to that approach, but it's integrating all of the data that we have available, the data that suggests that adjuvant chemotherapy does help patients at higher risk of recurrence, i.e. highest stage patients, and that those patients not only benefit with uh, slightly prolonged survival, but with long-term uh, freedom from recurrence and from death. Now, we undertook another uh, study uh, looking at clinical utility uh, of this assay in a prospective fashion. And uh, in this cohort from UCSF, uh, we analyzed the results of 50 or so uh, uh, patients who underwent prospective molecular risk stratification and for whom we had an average of about 15 months of follow-up. Of course, this assay has just been recently introduced, and so we don't have longer-term follow-up yet. But we asked a specific question. We said, can we look at the outcomes of our patients so far and figure out if there is a difference in the ability of this molecular risk assessment to better identify high-risk patients compared to the NCCN high-risk criteria that are being used right now uh, to, to support decisions for adjuvant chemotherapy. You can see that in our cohort of uh, 52 patients, 40% uh, were high risk uh, by both the molecular assay and the NCCN assay, but these were not the same 40% of patients. There was a substantial amount of discordance between the risk assessment between these two methods 37% uh, of stage one and 60% of patients in the critical stages 1b through 2a, those are the patients for whom the NCCN criteria are most important. And the NCCN criteria were different from the molecular risk profile in 60% of patients. Now here are some of the data from that study and perhaps the most important take home about whether or not this molecular uh, assay is reliable one and more reliable than the NCCN criteria number two is that zero uh, low risk patients according to the molecular assay suffered recurrence during our follow-up period where you can see a substantial percentage as high as 30% of the high risk patients recurred even with just a 15 month follow-up period. When you looked at NCCN, there were more recurrences uh, overall among their high risk patients compared to low risk patients but even that difference wasn't statistically significant in this cohort. And you can see that many of their low risk patients actually suffered recurrences even within 15 months. Looked at a different way, you can see here the discordance rates uh, among all patients, uh, and, and especially in that critical subcategory of stage 1B and 2A patients for whom these decisions are the most difficult for clinicians to make. Who gets adjuvant chemotherapy and who gets uh, uh, radiographic uh, surveillance alone. And you can see there were both kinds of discordances. There was NCCN high risk, molecular low risk, and there was molecular high risk and NCCN low risk. And you can see there was a lot of discordance, but in the end, the patients who were molecular low risk did not have any recurrences, even if they received a high risk categorization from NCCN criteria. And you can see the low risk NCCN uh, patients who got a high molecular risk actually had as high as a 22 to 25 percent recurrence rate, despite the fact that they were low risk by NCCN criteria, which would mean that they would not have received any intervention to try to lower that risk of recurrence and eventual death, since we know that almost all patients who recur with uh, lung cancer after resection eventually succumb to that disease. And I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the bottom of this slide uh, because what we also saw in this cohort was that um, there was generally, even at UCSF, relatively poor compliance with recommendations for adjuvant chemotherapy 
even in stages 1B and 2A and stage 2B, where, uh, again, patients are, are facing a difficult decision about a difficult chemotherapy in a post-operative period when they're trying to recover from an often uh, painful thoracotomy. And 70% uh, of the failure to comply with that recommendation uh, was due to patient refusal in our cohort. Patients who might benefit substantially from more refined prognostic information telling them that not only are they stage two or even stage one B, but they're at particularly high risk for recurrence and subsequent death. I'd also like to point out that 83% of the recurrences in this cohort, again, only 15 months of follow-up, but 83% of those uh, early recurrences occurred in patients who did not undergo adjuvant chemotherapy. 22% recurrence rate, again, in the patients who were discordant with a high molecular risk profile, but a low profile according to NCCM criteria. So finally, I'd like to sum up uh, by going over what we've had a chance to discuss uh, over the past uh, 40, uh, 45 minutes. I think it's clear that although our best tool uh, to date, conventional staging still does a relatively poor job of stratifying risk in early stage non-small cell lung cancer patients, particularly compared to other common solid tumors where a stage one uh, categorization usually means you have a 90%, in some cases a 98% chance of uh, cure of long-term survival after resection alone. In uh, non-small cell lung cancer, as many as 30 to 60% or more of patients who are undergoing complete attempt at curative resection must actually harbor undetectable metastatic disease and, and many of whom forego any attempt at early systemic intervention that it might actually cure their disease at a micrometastatic stage. I believe we've uh, documented that, uh, that there is reasonable evidence in uh, studies such as YALT, uh, JBR10, and even the ANITA study that suggests that micrometastatic non-small cell lung cancer will benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy and that the greatest benefit is observed among patients who are at the highest level of risk of recurrence and death after surgery. Since NCCN has already stepped over the line and has already determined that it should be recommended to patients at very high risk to undergo adjuvant chemotherapy to reduce that risk, even in the absence of prospective data for that category of patients. The challenge to clinicians is to make that determination with the most reliable and most accurate prognostic information possible. Patients are gonna face these difficult decisions and better data is almost certainly gonna to lead to better decisions and therefore better outcomes. Molecular prognosis based on assays such as the one that I've reviewed with you today, the Prevenio assay, uh, has been scientifically validated as a means of better identifying high-risk patients and therefore perhaps better implementing current NCCN recommendations. Again, the validation that we've discussed today was on a scale uh, roughly similar to the validation of the TNM uh, system for stage one itself. Now, this, this may uh, support the introduction of a slightly altered paradigm for the treatment of these early uh, stage uh, lung cancer patients, even patients as early as stage 1A, where the perception of low risk has in the past led just to monitoring alone, and when recurrence has, has uh, been documented, then introducing chemotherapy that, to be in my perspective as a surgeon, is really palliative in nature in the sense that it may prolong survival but is very, very unlikely to achieve cure. Instead, now we're looking at a group of patients who have the initial perception of low risk, but who then undergo molecular prognostic analysis. Now we have a much more uh, reliable uh, differentiation of high and low risk. Those low risk patients, of course, will continue to go on uh, for monitoring and surveillance, but those high risk patients now have the opportunity and have better confidence in that designation to undergo the opportunity for intervention in, in the form of adjuvant chemotherapy that might actually achieve risk reduction as they then follow on to monitoring and hopefully a much lower risk of recurrence. 
uh, and any need uh, for uh, reintervention in the future. Now, again, uh, this is all based on data that have been available to the lung cancer community for years. The question remains, can we pro prospectively uh, document that this strategy really has teeth and is going to result in better outcomes for our early stage lung cancer patients? The answer is, of course, yes, we can and have actually designed that prospective randomized clinical study, and it has been initiated. So we are now in the very early stages of actually uh, randomizing patients who are uh, by TNM staging criteria, stage one, but who receive a high risk designation pr from the Prevenio assay. We're randomizing those high risk stage one patients to adjuvant uh, chemotherapy versus their traditional standard of care uh, of monitoring uh, with radiographic surveillance. And by this perspective uh, randomization, we hope to document in uh, several years' time that the high-risk uh, identification through the molecular profiling actually allows for better management decisions in the sense that these patients receive an intervention and therefore have better outcomes uh, compared to patients treated by the conventional paradigm of monitoring alone. Again, that study has been designed, it's been initiated, and we're hoping to see results from that study in about uh, uh, four or five years' time. Now, of course, uh, many, many very, very talented uh, clinicians and uh, clinician scientists uh, have been involved in the development of this new clinical tool. Uh, it would be highly remiss uh, for me not to acknowledge their contributions. My uh, friend and uh, close colleague, uh, David Jablons, in our uh, Division of Thoracic surgery at University of California, San Francisco, and the founder and leader of our thoracic oncology program in our uh, comprehensive cancer center at UCCF, UCSF, uh, really helped me to lead this uh, development and validation program. Uh, and of course, uh, continues uh, to work uh, vigilantly on a daily basis to try to use this and other technologies to improve the outcomes of early stage lung cancer patients. Uh, Dr. Johannes Kratz, uh, who uh, together with Gavit Woodard uh, are completing uh, their uh, respective trainings at UCSF, contributed uh, substantially. Uh, Johannes really being a uh, linchpin in the development uh, and validation studies. Uh, Dr. Woodard more recently uh, contributing uh, to our prospective studies uh, ongoing with uh, UCSF uh, lung cancer patients. I've mentioned the Kaiser Northern California Division of Research. Uh, I'd particularly like to mention Stephen Van Neden, uh, who helps to lead that program and who is particularly instrumental in the planning and the execution of our large-scale validation studies. And of course, all of our wonderful colleagues uh, in China uh, who participated in the Clinical Trials Consortium and made the truly very, very large-scale validation of this study possible. Uh, I might also point out uh, at this uh, point that by comparing a, a predominantly Caucasian Northern Californian population to an entirely Chinese population, we really uh, were able to achieve a large degree of confidence that our assay was not in any way uh, idiosyncratic to a single population but really spoke to the biology of non-small cell lung cancer as it manifests across the globe. Uh, it was not, the success of the assay was not at all dependent on the unique genetic background of the population under study, but even with patients with very diverse genetic backgrounds, such as a Northern California population versus an entirely Chinese population, the assay was almost identically effective in differentiating high and low risk patients. So uh, the China contribution to all clinicians' ability to rely on this assay was really uh, very tremendous and very much appreciated. And of course, uh, numerous individuals at Pinpoint Genomics and more recently at Life Technologies uh, have also been instrumental, not only in making this assay CLIA certified uh, and available, but really relevant to clinicians uh, all over the country and uh, really very soon all over the world. So uh, with that, uh, thanks uh, to all the folks that helped to make this clinical science possible. I'd uh, particularly like to thank everybody who joined today uh, and also all of those uh, 
people who will uh, enjoy this talk uh, once it's posted on the web. Uh, you are really uh, the leaders for implementation of uh, new strategies and um, more scientifically driven uh, paradigms for getting better outcomes for our non-small cell lung cancer patients. Non-small cell lung cancer is reaching epidemic proportions. And even though we congratulate ourselves in the United States for reducing smoking rates and finally seeing gradual reduction in lung cancer incidences, uh, globally, it's a very different story. Uh, China is a particular tragedy, but even in other parts of the world, tobacco use is not on the wane. And as a result, uh, we're going to see an even greater epidemic and wave of uh, non-small cell lung cancer in coming years. We need uh, much more refined tools to help combat that uh, immense uh, public health crisis and uh, to get better outcomes for all patients, of course, late stage and, uh, and early stage alike. Again, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for making uh, this talk possible today and for participating. And with that, uh, I'll wish you a very good day.